ability to express our rights. My husband is this era's most significant pro-democracy activist. He made it his life's work to expose corruption and crimes committed by banks, by large corporations and by governments alike. Julian faces a prison sentence of 175 years in the United States because he did what true journalists are meant to do, to defend democracy by publishing the truth. And it is our job as the front line of the pro-democracy movement in this country to defend him from the ferocious authoritarian backlash that has been inflicted on him and which demeans the democracy that those who came before us fought so hard to attain. At the core of Julian's work through Wikileaks is the right to publish the truth, especially when it embarrasses those in power, for that is the essential ingredient in a true democracy. Julian is a political prisoner because he published evidence of war crimes and of tens of thousands of civilian killings in wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And ever since he published those things in 2010, he has been detained in one form or another in this country and three years in Belmont. Wars that we were lied into, wars that we opposed, wars that we marched to stop in our millions. Wars that lasted 20 years. Wars that brought laws into this country to progressively erode our rights here. Wars which we funded against our will. With the money successive governments has used, have used to enrich the merchants of war and divert the tax money away from us, away from the NHS, away from education and infrastructure. Decades of neglect that have led to taxpayers no longer being able to keep themselves warm in winter. Julian has dedicated his life to fighting for the weak and exposing the powerful. That's why the United States government wants to sentence him to 175 years. That's why they want him extradited. And that's why everyone who wants to live in a true democracy in this country must come together to fight for Julian's freedom. On the 8th of October, we will form a human chain around the Houses of Parliament, also known as the Palace of Westminster. We'll form a human chain to remind those inside that democracy does not reside, reside within their walls, but without them. To remind them that Julian Assange and you and me and millions of people around the world and in this country are part of a movement of democracy that came long before us and that our children and our children's children will continue to fight for long after we're gone. <laughs> that Julian Assange is in prison because he represents the democratic principles that successive governments have betrayed to demand that they free Julian Assange now. So I ask you, come to London, join me and thousands of others to form a human chain to surround Parliament on the 8th of October to bring democracy back to Westminster and to free Assange.
Julian, just down there is the Brent's Protection Pub. Stella's going to stay on for a film show and question and answer session. 6.30, Brent's Protection Pub upstairs, just down the road. But who's going to come? Thank you. Come right. The best filmmaker of all time. And, and, and I'm getting all these people. It's a real privilege to be here after my great friend and great comrade Audrey White. What a woman, trance star, trance woman. And before the best leader, leader the Labour Party has ever had. So before and it's also, it's also a privilege to follow um, with Julian's wife because his only crime is to expose the dirty secrets of our government in the United States. That's his crime. And the loser, the loser, not only is Julian, but our legal system, because they've been used for political purposes, and the idea that we represent the rule of law, where we imprison an innocent man for so long and torture him, makes a joke, makes a, makes a caricature of our claim. To be, used to be run by the rule of law. It is a travesty. I'd like to, uh, there have been some brilliant speeches, but I'd like to just concentrate on one issue. On, these, on this spot, 200 years ago, tens of thousands of people gathered to demand political representation. That was their demand. And they came at a time of poverty, of hunger, and of exploitation. And the ruling class was scared. And they were so scared, they sent in their military, they slashed their way through the crowd, they killed a dozen or more, and injured hundreds and hundreds. That's the response of the ruling class. Now, to get political representation, the Labour Party was formed. And I joined it in the early 60s. And I still have one of my cards and I'd like to read it to you. This is the function of the Labour Party. Some younger comrades may be surprised to hear it. This is their aim. To secure for the workers, by hand or by brain, the full fruits of their industry. And listen to this. And the most equitable distribution thereof that may be possible upon the basis of the common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange. That's the Labour Party. The tragedy had been, the tragedy had been that the leadership had no intention of carrying that through. Now we're faced with the same problem again, political representation. And at a time of crisis, not unlike the time of Peter Lou, because it's a time of hunger, poverty, exploitation, the search for workers' rights. But we also have the aftermath of 200, of 200 years. We have the collapse of the public services we thought we owned. We have their collapse. We have the collapse of the NHS, despite the brilliant hard work of all the many dedicated people who work in it. We have a homeless issue. We have housing, we have problems in the schools. Everywhere you look, we have workers' rights undermined, job cuts, wage cuts, the gig economy with insecure work. But most of all, we have, we have a desperate issue of poverty for many desperate, desperate families. And it will only get worse, we have the issue of energy costs. And transcending everything is the issue of climate change. The issue of climate disaster. And what a future we are leaving to our children and grandchildren. What a future, no future. The earth is becoming unsustainable. And that's the situation we, we face now. But we had a moment of hope. Remember we had a moment of hope. When Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonald and the, the few who supported them
what they achieved was the beginnings of a program to restore, or not to restore, to change the balance of society towards the working class, towards the ordinary people. That's what they achieved, and it was a, a program based on common ownership of the, of the utilities, of water, energy, uh, electric, gas, and so on. It was based on the ending the privatization of public services, restoring the health service to its founding principles. It was based on full union rights for every worker, from day one, that was the commitment, that was the program, we would have had it. Full union rights for every worker from day one. The Green New Deal, that would have made an urgent big start on, on, on climate, the climate disaster that is engulfing us. That was their program. And just like in Peterloo, the ruling class was scared shitless. And in 2017, in 2017, that's when they, when we nearly won the election, that's when they get worried. The full weight of the, the media, including the liberal media like The Guardian and the BBC, it did their best to destroy them. But here's the interesting thing. Who did they turn to when they wanted the attack? Not Tory MPs. Who did they turn to? The right wing of the Labour Party. The right wing of the Labour Party. And the right wing of the Labour Party used lies, smears, the most disgusting abuse, and the personal attack. I think we must never forget. We must never forget. Okay, I've got one more minute. I'll be quick. So what are the lessons of this time? First of all, and this is the building block of socialism, this society is driven by class conflict. It's irreconcilable. The ruling class and working class of interest that will never be reconciled until we change it. First lesson. Second lesson. The ruling class is ruthless. They will never give up. My friend Christopher Lowe wrote a poem, Know Thy Enemy. He said, sooner than give up the things he owns, he will destroy the world. And that's what he's doing now. Third lesson. The Labour right wing will never change. When Ramsay MacDonald walked away from the general strike in 26, when the Richard Kinnock and Hatton did the same in 84, Blair and Brown and their privatisations in the illegal wars, and of course, the most feeble dullard of the lot, Keir <laughs> Starmer. to destroy the possibility of hope within the Labour Party. That is his only talent. But the, the, the lesson, and I want to say, so please give me a few more seconds. The lesson is we have now to take a, a step change. We, we, let's face the fact we have no presence in the public media. No presence at all. We have here, amongst meetings, there are great organisations but we have no presence. How are we going to do it? We need a step change and this is my proposal, humbly made to the great and good here, that we have an independent labour movement. And it, begins, it begins with the trade unions because they are on the high now, just as they founded the Labour Party, it begins with them. They need to put some money into an infrastructure so that individuals can join, organisations can affiliate. And we need spokesmen along the major issues, recognise an official spokesman by that movement. I suggest the independent Labour movement. And we need it because if we allow ourselves to be silenced by Starmer, we betray the poor, the vulnerable, the people who desperately need a lead. We, be we betray those who need human rights fought for. And most of all, we betray those who wish to defend the climate. Because that's what we will do. That's what a Labour government, by like Jeremy or others, of his, of his views. So this is absolutely essential. And think of our strengths. All the campaigns, all the organisations, all the charities, the trade unions, the grassroots organisations, we do wonderful things. Some of them group together, the political groups. We have a massive strength. We have great academics. We all know the truth. We have a programme. 
we have to have a political voice now. <laughs> The slogan, the many, not the few, is a great slogan. And we know it from Shanna's great poem, written after Peterloo, The Mask of Anarchy. But remember the opening lines of that stanza. Rise like lions after slumber in unvanquishable number. And that's who we are. to which in the country, in which we are all joined. If we do not do that now, when can we do it? And this is the chance, this is why this is such an opportunity. Darwin, Starmer said, don't join a picket line, he was attempting to destroy the essential weapon in organized labor's army, the picket line and the strike. That's his challenge. We either rise to it, or we collapse. And I say we have to rise. Do it now. Solidarity. <laughs> what you don't know is that two days ago, Ben was filming in Newcastle. Grandpa